Square Ball Podcast. Well, hello there and welcome to the show. It's brought to you in association with West Yorkshire Electrical, the Monday show. WYelectrical.co.uk for details. Find them on social media as well. Don't just do stuff with wires in. They do roofs, don't they? They do They do roof roof work with wires or without wires. Mm-hmm. But if you're having it done, you might as well have to put some wires into and get some solar panels and that. Yep. That's exactly. And, and speak to them and they'll sort that. That's the expert advice, isn't it? From me, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If it has wires in it, they'll work with it. Specialists in all things electrical and specialists in renewables as well. So do battery storage, EV chargers, all the full shebang. You know you know about electrics, presumably at this stage. I do, yeah. but maybe the listeners don't. WYelectrical.co.uk for details. Hello, Phil. Hey, so we're recording oh. this. It's 6.30 on Sunday evening now. We thought we would uh, steal a march on this one and... Uh, Find out what it was like in the press box today, because that's the sort of theme, the loose theme of this show is the view from the press box. How was it for you? How was Daniel Farquhar in the post-match then? Well, 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 um, it's it's tight at the top, isn't it? Um, and a hell of a lot tighter than I thought it was going to be at this stage. One of the things we got on to chatting about with him afterwards, the press conference, was whether or not he genuinely thought at the end of December when it was 17 points to Leicester, um, whether he thought that gap could be bridged. And he said... Um, that he didn't really give it much thought at that point, which may or may not be true. Um, but was honest enough to say that had he given it a lot of thought and had he you know, seriously considered the, the chances of that, he, it, it, to use his word, unrealistic, you know, partly because Leicester was so good, partly because that is a, a massive, you know, massive gap to bridge um, and not easy to do. And also because I don't think at the end of December, we were seeing in Leeds necessarily the capability to be as reliable as they've they've become. I mean, they've been a machine since the turn of the year. They're just bulldozing through fixtures. And and I thought that today was just trademark Farker leads, really. It wasn't showy. It wasn't um, massively comprehensive in the sense of running to 3-4-5-0. Um, but there was very little in the game for Millwall, even though they started to take risks in the second half. There weren't that many occasions where you really felt like they were seeing the whites of Melier's eyes. Leeds just had, again, those slivers of class um, that made the difference. And that is why, time after time, managers like Neil Harris today are sitting down and saying, A, we you know, we can't realistically compete with this or, or hope to, to beat this, this sort of team over and over again because they, they just are too good. B, this is why Leeds are probably going up um, mm. because they play like this. They have these players. They have guys like Nonto who contributed very little um, before Christmas but is now scoring at a, a healthy rate um, guys like James who's up to almost 20 goals and assists combined um, Ruta who's almost up to 20 assists alone which is completely ridiculous um, just that that element and, and that degree which um, is very hard to compete with if you're a mid-table club or a club fighting relegation and actually has become really difficult to compete with if you're right up at the top too It's interesting isn't it how like the, the strain of the season is Perhaps it's impacted other clubs a little bit more than Leeds to this point. Again, caveat everything by saying there is a long way to go. But on the evidence so far, and again, it goes back to what Farker was saying about it all playing out as he thought it would. He's been around this block so many times and that's bringing so much assurance, I think, to the fans, isn't it? The thing is, there isn't that long to go, is there? Um, it's almost April, uh, eight matches left. And there's enough scope in there for the table, table to change pretty dramatically. And, and you would find it very hard to call at the moment. The one thing you, you have to say, and I think people on the outside looking in will feel this, is that Leeds have the momentum. Ipswich actually have found themselves a really good spell of form again. And, and if it hadn't been for what happened to them away at Cardiff, you know they'd be um, on a really long streak of, of wins themselves. But Leeds have the momentum and they have the, the impetus. And Farka is probably, of the three managers at the top, probably the the one who will be kind of least happy about this break coming around. I think he can see the value of a breather and I think it will be good for Leeds actually to be able to draw breath. But you don't generally tend to choose to take a bit of respite when you don't need it, which which Leeds don't at the moment. Uh, the, the problem for Leicester and Ipswich and also Southampton as well is that they, they can't really intervene with this. One of two things is going to happen now. Either Leeds carry on the way they're going, um, in which case it's it's not going to be feasible to, to stop them, or they're going to they're going to drop off um, and, and this form is going to going to elude them again. But that's not going to happen because of anything that Leicester or Ipswich are able to do because they won't play Leeds again this season. And Southampton don't come to Ellen Road until the last weekend. Um, hard to know what's going to be on that game. They're very much reliant on somebody from further down the table putting a spoke in, in the wheel, which just to this point hasn't looked like it happening. You say Farker might not welcome the break. 
I almost sense that he does. I yeah. think it's, it almost I, seems to me to be factored into his thinking. I, I think I think the reason why actually it's not the big help that it could be is because a lot of players will be away um, and a lot of players will play during it. Yeah. Um, he won't get much in the way of full training sessions with the, the squad. I, I often wonder how much that really matters when you get down to the back end of March and early April because you've drilled the players so much to this point and they understand the tactics inside out. So, you know, it's, it's more about maintaining fitness and, and managing load and, and everything else and, and obviously preparing for different clubs um, that you play against individually um, from a tactical perspective. But, you know, I don't think it handicaps Leeds massively that they won't necessarily be able to do a huge amount of preparation for Watford away. But as Farka said today, it's likely that Fulpo will miss that game. Um, he's going to be away with the, the Dominican Republic. And I don't think he's due back until that Friday. Certainly that's what Farka was saying. So that means a change to that position in the team. And whether or not you rate Fulpo or you want him at left back or whatever else, the, the you know, the results speak for themselves. The, the team as it is at the moment is really settled and, and is going along nicely. So I suspect you're right. I think the whole, you know, sofa coffee and cake thing from Farker is is a fair reflection of how he feels. I think it's been really busy to this point and he'll feel the need for a bit of a break, um, a chance to, to draw breath. And, and, you know, this is the last chance before you, you kind of go for the line. Um, but at the same time, it's probably not an ideal fortnight, this. And I just, you never really find that managers who are going along in the way that Leeds are, you know, have teams that are going along in the way that Leeds are, particularly want the games to stop. I've just looked back at the Bielsa season, actually, and a nice bit of symmetry. Nine games from the end of that, we played Neil Harris's Cardiff. That was the same, so it's the same sort of point of the season. Obviously, then it was a weirdly compressed post-COVID part where there was every game was played within about a month, wasn't it, after that? So that felt very intense, whereas we've got ages to wait to be promoted now. Yeah, I think the psychological angle of it which we spoke about on the show like previewing this weekend shouldn't be underestimated the fact that no. they they can go into this break and point to the table and so we're top of it and, and you know Leicester they have the game in hand and may well win it but from a, like I say psychological point of view saying that we finally made it to the summit we've, we've reeled you in over all this time I think is, is really significant but also I was going to say from a psychological point of view um just breaking up the routine of it as well like the the amount of sort of travel training travel training that they've had to deal with in the last sort of month or two just to take the take all the the, the repetition out of that the, the the steam out of that the wind out of those sails and just it, so even if players are going away to play for wales or whatever it's a different kind of travel it's a different company it's you know it's it's a different setup it's not just doing that same thing over and over again in that same bubble i think i think that's true there's, there's definitely yeah. an, there's an important angle there well far could Afterwards, I was I was quite fascinated, really, to see how he approached it afterwards. Because you'll have seen his reaction to the second goal um, when it it went in. He didn't tend what, to show. What did he do? I didn't say I haven't seen. He it. didn't. Oh, he did no. punch in the air. You right. know, it's kind of display of emotion that you don't often get from Farker or or not like that. Um, he said afterwards, and I suspect this is right. Actually, he said the second goal was important because we needed it. You know, they needed it to go top, um, but they needed it in the game as well, irrespective of what it was doing to the table. The crowd could tell that. 1-0 was not a, a good position at that point. Millwall was starting to gamble a bit. The changes helped them. Um, yeah, they, they, were, they were getting some fo some bodies forward, thought, weren't they? But yeah, became a handful and, and quite difficult. But again, you know, a little bit like that spell of the game where Norwich were on top at Elland Road. There wasn't a lot coming from it. You know, it wasn't as if you felt like Melee was permanently on the, the edge of, of conceding. Um, but he did say, Farker, you know, we do need to enjoy this to a degree, being top of the table, because you work for it and you work hard for it. And if you don't enjoy or take the satisfaction of the of, of what that leads to and what you achieve, then what's the point? You know, as he put it, one day you look back and think, well, why did we all slog ourselves in the way that we did if when we got to the table we were all very matter-of-fact and, you know, straight-laced yeah. about it? That's true, yeah. But at the same time, he said, you know, it's important that you don't get distracted. I asked him, and, and I think this is a fair question, really, whether or not he thinks Leeds are now best placed to finish this off. Um, because I suspect at the moment, if you did a straw poll of people who follow the championship closely, including you two, I think most people would probably say, well, nobody looks like they're in better shape at the moment. And I think, to, to look at this from Leicester's perspective, um, just briefly, I think it's really difficult to rationalise the loss of a 17-point gap. Like, that's a massive advantage that you've thrown away. And I, I don't think that's very easy to explain in the sense of, you know, well, this is how it goes and... and sometimes things turn for the worst. That's a really, really massive, massive swing. Um, but to repeat what I was saying on the, the podcast before today's game, they haven't done a right lot 
wrong Leicester you know even this run where I think it's 11 points they've dropped in in five games like the championship does that to everybody sooner or later there's always a period of the season where where that happens and they're still on 82 points in the way that Ipswich are, are on 81 as well it's just uniquely competitive this and it's still it's still too close to call I think no absolutely yeah well I say just it just feels nice we've, we've seen a nice win with a nice team I think that we all quite like now um, that's all settled down, hasn't it? The relationship between the, the, the crowd and the players. I was thinking about that today, actually, when the game was going on, that the players have all got songs now. Whereas at the start of the season, it was just kind of, what's this season going to bring? What's it going to look like? You're a little Judas bastard because you went out. You, you know, you want out. We're never mm. quite sure about Sinistera. He went. Nonto made the noises to leave. And suddenly, Nonto scoring crucial goals. There are songs for, I mean, obviously we know about the Nonto song, something we don't need to get into. Mm. But I'm thinking like Ampadu, Furpo, all these different players. Um, oh, so you're back in the division that you took so long and what's so hard to get out of and nobody wanted to be to be back in and it and it goes without saying that if you're in the championship you can sign players that you want to and that you I mean as you saw in, in the BLC era players that you'll remember for life and, and players that you'll you'll respect for life but you don't get the the truly elite players um in the championship you know your best footballers like Rafinha and others are, are what you get when you're in the Premier League and you've got the money to to work with it so I'm like you I kind of wondered or I was like you I kind of wondered what the relationship would be like with the team and whether as I've said previously, this would all feel a bit transactional. You know, like you just need to need to get out of this league, get it done. If we win lots of games, great. But in the end, it's all about where you're getting to. But I think I think that's changed, and I think people are I think people are enjoying it more than that. Um, and and you made this point. You know, when they went up in 2020, the city didn't get it properly. Did they? they didn't get the experience of promotion properly. And I think it's important that that you know if that happens this time, that 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 does occur. And mm. you know, you do do it in the way that you're. You're supposed to, as opposed to COVID-affected celebrations where they wheel, wheel out a bus purely for the purposes of people celebrating and then going home pretty quickly, which yeah. is what that was all about. For the documentary and all that. Yeah, you know what? The closer it gets, the more it feels like it's within touching distance, the more I reflect back on 2020 and feel like I really missed out. At the time, I was all right with it because you kind of, you, you know, you weighed it up against what was happening with the pandemic, which was horrible. And, you know, we can't choose when we go up all we can do is you know we want to go up at the, the earliest possible opportunity don't we you know I suppose uh, what you would say though is that it was a totally unique period of time wasn't it like there won't it was different in a way that I don't think you'll ever see again the way it was structured the break in the season the way in which the games had to be played the absence of crowds I'm not saying it was a good thing um but it was a, an absolutely unique promotion season that in a way that I think and I wonder how Norwich looked back at Farkas two promotions, whether the second one felt very much like the first one. It, it certainly seemed to be easier, the second one. And I wonder whether that makes it seem like a bit more of a procession and, as I say, a, a bit more transactional. Whereas with Bielsa in 2020, it just felt like every drop of blood, really, didn't it? Like that a proper pound of flesh um, to to get that done um, with some, some pretty remarkable football. Um, but I think I think with Farkas, he, he, people are always going to say, you know, the squad is is there to win promotion and it and it definitely is. Um but his management of it I think's been been pretty superb. And the start that jumps out at the moment is the fact that they haven't conceded from open play since December the thirtieth. I mean that's just that's ridiculously good. Yeah. Um and and granted, there are a lot of clubs in the championship who don't offer a huge amount when it comes to um attacking football and certainly not at Ellen Road. But even so, you know, to, to go back to what we're saying about Leicester and the fact that the, the championship tends to do what what it's doing to them at the moment to, to everybody at some stage. It's nigh on impossible to go through three months without conceding from open play. Yeah, I think that, you know, whilst we do have the dice very much loaded in our favour in terms of, you know, squad and resources and parachute payments and all that, it's not our fault, is it? We, all we can do is enjoy what's in front of us and I'm enjoying myself at the minute. Yeah, but, but it doesn't mean that they automatically all play well. And it doesn't mean that the, the changes you choose to make work. It doesn't mean that if you throw... Bamford in for Pirro that that suddenly solves whatever it is that isn't quite working it doesn't mean that and we saw it at Stoke away didn't we actually yeah. how, it, how we really sort of struggled through that game yeah, and, and it was repeated definitely. a couple of times wasn't it and, and Nonto I think is a really good example as well of just teasing him back into into form um, from a period where his mind didn't seem right you know his, his attitude didn't seem to be there it, it just seemed like a bit of an unhappy relationship but suddenly he's coming up with goals like today's which was an you know just absolute banger and, and what, what was needed because it's a pretty flat first half today yeah good though <laughs> well yeah yeah um, but it's just uh, it's just trademark Farker and Leeds I think yeah he's um, yeah we, I mean we've been laughing on like the, the other shows haven't we Michael about his your requirement was it 27 goals you said 
That was early in the season, I think. Yeah, yeah. When you were angry with completely him. Yeah, arbitrary. Oh, what in, in order to, um, to redeem himself? himself yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. but I, I think given, actually that seems completely fair and rational. I think the yeah. importance of the goals he scored this year uh, are, are certainly getting us there. It feels like he's he's not just adding the third or anything, is he? The nonce. He's opening the score and he's scoring. He got the winning yeah. goal at Bristol, didn't he? And I feel like the I don't know. He's playing a vital part in this. It's interesting. I had a chat with somebody around New Year in the January window. Said so I, I don't see the sense in retaining Nonto. I'd cash in on him and maybe reinvest it in two or three other players mm-hmm. to to get you up. And actually, you can see why now, why why it was worth making him stay. <laughs> to be quite honest, <laughs> yeah. I think I think quite a lot of people seem to be fairly philosophical back in the summer. You know, when when it got when when it got really kind of awkward between him and Leeds and, and that was at its height, I was getting the sense that a lot of people were thinking, well, you know, just take the money. Just just get rid of it. And I think that was a fair attitude at the time. And again, in January, he hadn't done much to that point. So the argument that if you take the money for Nonto and reinvest it, you might actually benefit was um, was totally, totally valid. But there's a player who has been managed into to form. And, you know, Dan James again today, it, it, it's easy to say, well, you know, it's, they're not in the Premier League anymore. So James is more likely to have an impact and are more likely to be useful. But the criticism of James was always that he didn't have any end product. You know, he didn't create, he didn't score goals. He, he was quick and that was pretty much it. Well, you know, the, the stats say differently and I don't think that happens by chance. I think that does come down to good culture, good atmosphere and, and good management. It does look like Dan James has kind of finally settled, doesn't it? He looks yeah. more, a little bit more sure of himself and what he should be doing. He always he's always got that quizzical look on his face, Dan James, when after he's done something that hasn't quite worked out. But we've seen that less and less this season because he's coming up with with end products. And do, do you think maybe, and this is something I think I floated on one of our shows, is that Farker is responsible maybe for simplifying things for him a little bit and telling him what he needs to do, where he should be, what what uh, is expected of him, which is to you know to use his pace, drive towards goal and try and come in on the back post, whatever it might be. Yeah, and, and also to, to play it wide. I know Bielsa thought that, that James was a potential nine, um, but it never really seemed to work. And, and I think because in particular, it was a season that wasn't going well when he came from, from Man United, um, it became it became tough for him because he, you know, being used out of position and sometimes even being in position, it wasn't easy to make much of an impact and it was all kind of falling apart round about him. Um, I, think, I think there is quite a, a high level of simplicity in Farkas' tactics, which I think benefits quite a lot of the players. It isn't, they, they don't take massive risks and, and it isn't all gambled on, you know, kind of all out, all out attacking football all the time. Um, but I was writing this after, I think after the Sheffield Wednesday game and saying, even if you want to see Leeds be, you know, a bit more out there when it comes to the risks they are taking or to, you know, to be a, a bit more adventurous, why would you when the form is like this? You know, when you when you're conceding so few goals and so you know virtually none from open play for for this period of time anyway, why would you break from the model that's yeah. working so well? I was going to say all those cliches. Only twenty eight goals conceded, best goal difference in the division. It's almost like he knows what he's doing. Yeah, it? but Birmingham four leads five was exciting, wasn't it? It was. I mean, <laughs> it was. He's very near killed me. But. <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I suppose you know when it was a bit flat at Ellen Road at the start of the season. Yeah, uh, I think maybe yeah there was this kind of a. We were missing that, that that kind of element of chaos and that emotional turmoil. Well, to a they, they, we were addicted to it. I think to go back to the the win over Millwall in that promotion season, they were they were two up, didn't they? In that, and it was a comeback, and it was Pablo scoring, and everything was I don't know, everything was hyped up on it. But just going and winning two 0 quite comfortably today, it was just well, nice. You know, say, I think we spoke about this on the match ball, didn't we? Saying like the difference between that side and this side is that Leeds would have continued just bombing forward regardless at that point. Whereas today, they sometimes just broke the game up, put a foot on it, looked after the ball for a bit, slowed it down, you know, knocked it around between the, the centre-backs for a bit, dropped it into midfield, dropped it back and just try and draw the opposition on and stuff. Whereas it would have been gung-ho. And, and it's not that's not to, in any way levels as a criticism of that season because it was absolutely amazing and I, I loved watching Bielsa's football. Of course, football. it was it was brilliant. Um, but, but every time of, every type of football has um, weaknesses in it, doesn't it? And um, has its its own shortcomings, whatever they yeah, may be. Yeah, but you also have to have your own way and I, I suspect the, the worst thing you could ever do at Leeds, um, or in general actually, is to try and copy what Bielsa does or emulate what Bielsa does or try to essentially be him. It's, it's, I think it's been quite telling that when Marsh was here, as an example, there was constant talk in press conferences and everything else about Bielsa. It came up all the time. It really hasn't much with Farker at all. And In fact, to be totally honest, the, the only time I can really think of that being mentioned was when he said himself, you know, like we're ahead of that side when it comes to points per game or position after a, a certain number of fixtures. It was him who, who drew the, the comparison. And I think 
it probably it, it probably says something about how you know how well respected he is by the crowd that there isn't this constant thing of well Bielsa did this and Bielsa did that and this mm. is how they played you you just got to take Farkas football on its own merits and whether it's as exciting or not you know, the, the results really do speak for themselves. It's effective, and, isn't it? That's the thing. It's effective, but I do think it's better than effective, yeah. don't you? I well, think as well what Farc has done is, in the same way Bielsa had to, was banish some really bad memories of what had gone before yeah. it. Because straight away with Bielsa came in, you were like, oh, fine, we can forget about hacking bottom and all that terribleness. And likewise, I think Farc has come in and just straight away, you're like, oh, thank God it's not Marsh, thank God it's not Allardyce. Yeah. Or Gracia, who was there for five minutes in the middle and felt fine <laughs> although, for, like, although for like a couple of weeks. Do you know, I think Grassi's football is actually quite similar to Farkas in, in what he was trying or not trying to do, but I think Farkas has a more defined tactical plan. Yeah, I, I felt like um, Gracia's was more defensive, more defensively minded than than Farkas. It will be interesting. I think you'll get a far better comparison once you go up into the Premier League and, and um, if that happens. And, and you know, Farkas has to decide how he's going to play, what he's going to do against sides who who will try to dominate you and say to you quite often can't stop dominating you, you know, like, like mm. City and, and others. Um, but it's not, I don't think it's negative Farkas football at all. And, and that sounds pretty obvious given how many goals they've scored and where they are in the, in the league. I just think he, I just think he sets limits on some of, of what they do. Um, but for really, really good reason. And if you were saying to him, you should be doing this differently or that differently, he would just say, well, would why? You, would you describe it more as like sensible attacking? Pragmatic, yeah, would be a good word. Like yeah. we, we break a lot. A lot of it's predicated on the break being effective at breaking and transitional plays, and we're dead I, good at that. I also think it's not arrogant, you know, in the sense that it's not saying we've got all these attacking players, so let's just, you know, let's just try and overrun Millwall um, and and attack them to death and try and score six or seven goals. I think it you, you get enough out of the attacking players, and if you look at the goals scored and assists and everything individually across the squad, it's really really impressive. Um, so it's kind of like maximising the output or at least getting very good output from them without trying to get too much. Um, I just think the balance has, has been right. And I'd, I wouldn't say at the moment they're looking wildly fresh, Leeds. I think they've they've definitely had to find reserves of stamina through the past few um, few weeks. But with the exception of the Leicester game, they haven't looked in much trouble either. Yeah, and you can say to the players as well, like, like you know, you've, you've got to where we were setting out out to get to at the start of the season which would be top of the table you've done that um, and now the finishing line is in sight and it's not something to be scared of it's it's another eight games left to play and then you get to have a break and hopefully to to celebrate your achievements yeah I was going to ask just talking about the, the sort of post Bielsa thing do you think we're finally emerging from his shadow and we kind of addressed that in the, in the point that we just um, discussed there not his shadow but the shadow of that time and the I'd, expectations I, yeah, that came I would, with I would it. say so it suddenly feels like a different era because we felt this. we felt just felt rudderless afterwards the stuff yeah. that we tried to do afterwards just you know zigzagging from one thing to another and it was all kind of underpinned by a lot of Victor Orta's whims and whereas we're seeing now this very sort of systematic data-led approach from the, the 49ers and all the people that are in the club there on the playing side and it's a huge number isn't it yeah that are, that are, and I I don't think that this squad was necessarily as easy to put together as people would assume you know, it, it was there was a lot of movement needed um, in the summer. I I wrote a couple of weeks ago about Nick Hammond and his role in the background, um, doing doing all of this. Um, and you know, I've read a few people say somebody tweeted me back after a piece I'd written. I think it might have been about Hammond actually. Show saying, us a picture of you. Put a picture of your bird on. No, here, sadly, <laughs> sadly not. Um, it was saying <laughs> they've um, they've got they've got a Premier League squad, so they would get promoted. I don't think that's true at all. I don't think this is a squad that would, if you went up with this and played in the Premier League with this squad, I don't think it would necessarily stay up. Um, but it's very, very good by championship standards. Um, that, as far as I'm aware, is the name of the game, isn't it? Build yourself yeah. a squad and a team that gets you out of the league. And as we were saying last season, like there's been too much looking steps down the road mm -hmm. I think, with Leeds at, at times. Um, let's get up and then figure out what we're going to do when we're there. And I'm, that's not to suggest that they shouldn't start planning for the, very, oh, they, the various oh, will, contingencies. Oh, be, no, yeah, we know, know that they are. Yeah. Absolutely. But the, the interesting comparison will be between what they do, if they go up, what they do in the transfer market compared to what they did back in 2020 um, and the, the sort of subsequent seasons to see whether some of the bets are a little bit safer, um, whether they go for a few more sure things rather than anything too, too out there. I mean, I have to say, some of the players that they did sign initially, you know, I do think there's a, a decent defender in Robin Koch. And when he came with good reputation, Germany and national didn't seem like a stupid sign in that one. Likewise, Rodrigo in Spain. But the more you look at it, the more you just don't think that there was enough 
joined up thinking in what they were doing in the, the kind of next squad that they were trying to build. Yeah. It's probably telling that this season there's not been a huge amount of upset about the squad insofar as in the Bielsa season it was, well, the first one it was we need a key, keeper and we got um, Kiko Casilla. Second season we need a striker and we got John Kevin Augustan. Throughout all of them, we needed more cover in midfield and we just never bothered. It was just <laughs> Mateus Click, hopefully we'll be fine. But it, it feels like this year we've, I don't know, people have gone, okay, yeah. Yeah, there was, there was a lack of insurance, wasn't there? And we've gone yeah. out in, we needed a fullback, and we've gone out in January and got someone who yeah. was in the team of the championship last year, and you go, yeah, all right, that we, all, this all seems perfectly sensible. You know, we were saying, quite nice if they signed a left-back. I mean, what would have been the point, to, you know, up until now, would a left-back have played? I don't think they would. Um, you've got Byron on the bench, who if Firpo isn't um, available for Watford, will come into the team. It's not as if whoever could have been signed in January would, would be playing ahead of him because Farker thinks an awful lot of, of Byram. Um, and looking back at January now, what else really would you have done apart from a, a right back? You know, you're still looking at Creswell getting basically zero minutes this season. Um, Cooper hardly playing, Ampadu in that position. Strike, um, it, you, got, you very much got the vibes from Farker on Friday that he suspects that Strike might need to go for surgery now obviously they've still got to make that decision but I think when you start talking like that saying the next 10 days will be decisive and everything else you you, you get the vibe that that might well be happening um, but even if Strike, given that there are 8 games to go even if Strike was to come back now I, it's really hard to see him playing because I, yeah. I just don't see him breaking up this um, these centre backs that, that he's got at the moment yeah and Too good. Uh, 10 days brings us round to the end of March and you know that gives us what five weeks until the end of the season there's yeah. no point in taking the risk is there especially when we've we've actually and it's no fault of Pascal Strokes but we've looked better with him out of the side because yeah. because of what Ampadu and Rodon have done well it's that weird thing isn't it if you take Piro out of the team and I think Leeds have looked better for that with Bamford in it um he's quite quiet today Bamford I thought but you know so still did enough um you lose strike you have to shift Ampadu out of midfield and again like you say you certainly don't look any worse for it um, and the defensive record as it is at the moment it's not just you know the, the number of goals that are going in it's the number of, it's the quality of chances they're giving away which are very very low you know it's not that like teams are creating lots of big chances against them um, not that many shots on goal against them very very few shots on target comparatively to the, the rest of the division it's the, the actual stats that tell you that defensively they're very very good I'd really like us now just to come back after the break obviously free of any additional injuries from the internationals and just keep winning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just, just, just win the last eight games. Lads, and... just go out there and make it look easy for me. Just, just for once, please in my lifetime. So I can look back and say there was that season when everything was just very, very chill. The winds have been, they have been pretty chill, haven't they? There's it not been, there's not very tense. There's not an awful lot of back and forth on them, is there? The way, I suppose the Preston game went to the wire, didn't it? We needed the late winner in that. I, th I, th I think that's been one of the most critical games of the and season. And Leicester though. was fairly insane. But the rest of the run has generally felt like yeah. quite regulation wins. Like even the nerves today against Millwall were kind of inspired by a sort of Leeds United PTSD, if you like, thinking back to historic times when we've blown it and uh, you kind of expect them to do it again. You know, people will always cite what happened against bloody Wigan um, yeah, over Easter I, in, the, in the first Bielsa season you go oh, well, you never know that might just be the, the, the train that's coming down the track towards us again I'd, I'm not even sure there was any bigger picture stuff to it today I just think people could see that Millwall were getting into the game and were thinking well it's only 1-0 so if, yeah. if they score we've, you know it's it's a problem um, what I did think was funny was even though the game was quite clearly won in injury time that sort of palpable fear among the crowd or that sort of little nervousness um Everybody knowing that if Millwall scored, you'd drop down a second. On yeah, goal yeah, yeah. It really makes a, a massive difference. But, you know, psychologically, I do think it's it's pretty important. But it's quite rare to see that when you know the game's done, but everybody's a bit anxious about Millwall, you know, pushing up and committing men forward and everything else. But they, they deserved it today. And, yeah, I mean, the, I, I, I do think the, the, the day, the night when I thought they looked like they're going up with Swansea, um, because that was just that totally steamroller Swansea down there and what I thought could be quite a difficult game, a horrible night as well. But I think the the result that really, really opened the door to Otmack promotion being possible was um, the Preston mm. game. That that late goal from Piddle, I honestly think everybody would have come away from that if it had been one all thinking it's going to be the playoffs because Leeds are doing 
too much of what they're doing, what they were doing before Christmas, which is dropping points here and there, and and not all the time, but regularly enough to mean that the the lead above them was was a problem. But from that point, they they really have motored. It's been great, hasn't it? And um, let's hope it just continues. Another eight games. That's all we ask. Um, so we're going to take a break now over the international break. We'll come back with a show to preview the Watford and the whole games. And then we'll come back after the uh, the long Easter weekend and uh, and see where we are then. But uh, another it's another tick in the box, isn't it, in the positive column? Um, and while people will enjoy the spoils of going top, we all know, I think, all of us, that there's still a long way to go yet. So we don't get carried away. Oh, it, it was cheesecake as well, wasn't it? It was cheesecake for Farker. Yeah, did you, uh, was it Graham who asked yeah, that one? Yeah, just as he was going out on Friday. Said to we, never found, we, didn't, we didn't find out whether that what flavour it is. I'm thinking classic New York. Yeah, I think um, so. But are you having berries with it, a little coolie on the side, mm. that kind of thing, you know? Yeah, I reckon so. I reckon yeah. so. Aye. But I need to, these are the questions that need to be answered. Yeah. Yeah. Next time. Next time. There's always a next time. Right, Phil, Michael, cheers. Right. Thank you. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the international break. Phil will catch up before Watford, yeah? Excellent. See you soon. The Square Ball Podcast.